morning, friends, and welcome to The Point. We just want you to know that whether you are right here in the room with us or you are joining us online, we are super grateful you are sharing these next moments with us together. It is so amazing to me the way that God meets with us right here like this as we worship Him and share these moments in community together. Perhaps this is your first time to join us here at The Point, so we want to extend a special welcome. It can be a little intimidating to check out a new church, so thanks for being here. If you walk through our doors and are in person with us, would you let us know you're here by scanning the QR code on the back of the seat in front of you? And if you are joining online, the link to that same QR code will be posted in the chat. Just click on it. This allows us to make a connection with you and we value connection here at The Point. When you do that, we will make a donation to a local food bank here in Seymour as a way of thanking you for joining us. So welcome, we're glad you're here. Now, for those of you who are new around here, whether it's one week or a bunch of weeks, we want to invite you to take the next step to find out more about this place by attending Starting Point. Starting Point happens today immediately following the 9.30 and 11 o'clock services. Look for the starting point banner on your right as you exit the worship center. This 20 minute get to know us better session will give you a brief intro to the church and give you a chance to get answers to most of your questions. If you have kids and point kids, know that they will be well cared for during this short info session following the service. Something else we value greatly around here is serving. And I have a great way you can engage with serving to help one of our local partner ministries. Every year, The Point is part of the Baby Bottle Campaign that is directly tied to Clarity. Clarity is a local ministry in Seymour and the surrounding area that desires to create a culture where every human life is valued and celebrated as a gift from God. They exist to compassionately engage, educate, and inspire our communities with truth regarding holistic sexual health and the value of human life. We are excited to partner again with Clarity in 2024 through the Baby Bottle Campaign. It's really simple. Just grab a baby bottle from one of the stations at each end of the lobby, take it with you and fill it with your extra change, some cash, or even a check made out to the point. Over the next couple of weeks, we will be collecting those baby bottles filled with generosity and blessing the ministry of clarity. Thanks for making a difference. Speaking of making a difference, you all continue to amaze me with your desire to make a difference through your generosity. If you want to join the generosity movement here at The Point, here are the ways that you can do just that. You can give online at gotothepoint.com You can text The Point Give to 888-364-4483, or you can mail a check to 311 Meyer Street here in Seymour. And if you're in the room with us, by the way, if you didn't already know, there are some black boxes on the back of the room to drop your offering in if you so choose. Today is a special day here at The Point because we get to partner with some families in what we call parent dedication. We are honored to partner with families from the very beginning of their journey. We want to be a consistent source of encouragement, strength, and resourcing as they raise their child to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Parent dedication is the first step in what we call our faith phases. What are faith phases? Well, take a look. At The Point, we want to partner with parents to prioritize their family's spiritual growth. As a ministry, we only have about 40 hours per year to invest in kids and students, but parents have about 3,000 hours per year. That is why we created Faith Phases. Faith Phases is a plan that provides focus, structure, and clear next steps to help families point their kids to Jesus. It includes key milestones at each phase of a child's development and intentional experiences planned for parents and children to learn and grow spiritually and relationally. In a world that pulls us in many different directions, our desire is that Faith Phases is a resource helping families point their kids to Jesus and doing what He did, loving God with everything. Good morning, church family. How are we doing this morning? Good. 
It's a little chilly out, right? So this morning at first service, I mentioned I'm originally from Minnesota, and so the weather is nice and refreshing. Um, and then my wife said to me that I should be probably be wearing shorts and my Chaco sandals just to prove a point. Uh, but I am <laughs> I'm wearing the appropriate clothing. So uh, my name is Tim Ferrett. I am the Family Ministries Director here at The Point. I'm also the student pastor over our 7th through 12th grade programming. Uh, and I just wanted to follow that up with that reminder that this fall we did launch our faith phases. Uh, and so if you've been with us as a church for long enough, you've kind of heard us reference being an orange church, that we believe the yellow light of the church and the red heart of the home combined together to make a great influence upon families. And so uh, Faith Phases is our best resource for parents, starting with parent dedication when their children are young, up through senior high and graduation. And so if you have any kiddos in any of those phases, be sure to grab one of these brochures from our lobby and check out our website. Uh, just, that just details all of those resources that we have for you as a family. <clears throat> and when we have Parent dedication, kind of starting out those faith phases as a family. We gift our families. We have the uh, Voiles and Dickens family up here this morning for dedication. And we've gifted them a marble jar. There's 52 marbles in the jar so that if they were to choose, they could take out a marble for each week of the year of their child's life and kind of see how much time they have with them year in and year out. Um, and so I know for some of you, it may be kind of feel like, oh, that's so sad. They're losing their marbles and seeing how little time they have left. But it is a joyful thing because it's a great visual reminder that we want to count our days so that we make our days count, both for these families with their young ones, as well as a church with the kids and students that we have uh, worshiping with us here at The Point. Uh, now, these parents have shared a few things about their kiddos with us as they imagine the end, uh, the time when their kiddos will be moving on out of their home. And so we're going to hear what they had to share with us this morning. This is Olive Annabella Dickens, daughter of Jake and Autumn Dickens. Jake and Autumn share, we would like to take an outward step before our community of faith that we are dedicating this precious child to God and committing to raise her to know God and learn his ways. From the moment Olive entered our lives, she became a beacon of light and a symbol of the infinite love that binds our family together. We want her to carry with her, always, the knowledge that she is not only our daughter, but a child who was forever chosen and forever loved. As her parents, we pray Olive will grow into a compassionate and joyful young lady. Olive is the most gentle little girl. She has an infectious smile and the best sense of humor. She loves cuddles and is incredibly joyful and full of sparkle. This is Josephine Josie Grace Voiles, daughter of Zach and Sarah Voiles. Zach and Sarah share we would like to make a public commitment to raise Josie in a Christian household, surrounded by a Christian community. We want her to know about Jesus and his love for her, and want her to be in a community where she can learn more about God through his word and through the example of others. As her parents, we wholeheartedly pray that Josie will blossom into a compassionate, humble, generous, trustworthy, and faithful young woman. Josie has been the most precious gift to us, one that we didn't know we would get, and we're thankful to God for giving her to us. She is her daddy's girl, a thinker who takes things in and studies all around her. But once she's comfortable, her giggles and laughter come out. She is very transparent, and you never have to guess her mood, a trait she gets honestly but her smile lights up our days. She is affectionate, and we appreciate her sweet and caring ways. Yes. <laughs> well, aren't we thankful for Olive and Josephine? Oh my goodness, you beautiful girls and your beautiful families. We're grateful for you all as parents. Uh, the reason we call it parent dedication here at The Point is because we believe that you all are making a, a commitment to dedicate yourselves, not just your children, but to de dedicate your lives to the raising of Olive and Josephine. And that that is 
Like we believe that is the most important thing that you can do. And we want you to know that we are with you. Uh, And we want you all to know that we are with you. We know that sometimes days like today uh, can be hard uh, for maybe folks that have uh, experienced infertility or the loss of a child. And we want you to know as well that you are not alone today as we celebrate, um, but also believe that sometimes grieving can live in those same places. So know that you're not alone, uh, but we are just grateful and honored to be doing this uh, with you today as you all dedicate your lives to the raising of Olive and Josephine and I believe that this is what God has for you all as a family. For thousands of years, he's been calling families and his people to remember the most important thing, to love God with everything. There's actually a prayer uh, in Deuteronomy that the people of Israel prayed every day that reminded them of this central reality that God wanted for their lives. We're going to read it together today. It says in Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. Love him with everything. And these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. And you are to impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. This prayer really was a reminder that loving God with everything is everything. Uh, Not only for your own lives individually, but for Olive and for Josephine that your commitment today, your dedication is to say with every part of our lives, we're going to lead Olive and Josephine towards Jesus so that one day they could experience an encounter with Christ that would change everything as they learn to love him with everything. And we want you all to know as a church family that this isn't just something that we spectate in, and uh, but that God calls us to participate together as the people of God. And so we have just a little liturgy that we like to do with parent dedication that has some kind of uh, responses and statements about who we are as the people of God, who God is calling you to be as parents. And for all of us to know that we want to be with you as you parent your children, but also that we want to be a part to help point Josephine and Olive towards Jesus with you. So I'm just going to do a few statements. There's going to be sections where you all will say, I do. And then the congregation, you all together will commit and say, I do as well in these different statements. It says this, God has entrusted us with an amazing responsibility. Uh, Do you accept, you all as parents, accept the responsibility to raise your child in the ways of Jesus? If so, say we do. And church family, do you accept that responsibility to help them lead their children towards Jesus? If so, say, we will. We will help you. There you go. Say that. Here's God has given you all the the wonderful gift of life. Will you do everything in your power to protect and nurture the gift that God has given you? If so, say, we will. And church family, will you come around these families and help them protect the gift that God has given them? If so, say, And last, God commands us to teach our children through the example of godly life, your example of your life. Will you strive to live your lives in a way that points them to live and reflect the life of Jesus? And church family, will you do the same? That every time that Olive and Josephine walk here in this place and see your life, do you commit that they will see Jesus through you? If so, say what a commitment we've made and what a commitment you've made to dedicate your lives to raising your children towards Jesus. Let me pray for you guys, okay? Heavenly Father, God, I'm grateful so much for these families and for your call upon their lives. God, to point Olive and Josephine towards you with every moment of every day. And I pray for these folks as parents, God, that you would just stir their hearts uh, to the beautiful but also heavy commitment and responsibility to care for these precious lives. And Lord, I pray your blessing upon them in Jesus' name that you would stir their hearts, grow them deeper in relationship with you. And most of all, God, that Olive and Josephine would be captivated by your love for them and be awakened to the purposes that you have for their lives. God, we're grateful and honored to be here in this place, to come alongside these families. In Jesus' name, we dedicate these kids and these families to you. We pray this in your precious name. Hey, a big good morning and welcome to each and every one of you from the praise team. We ask that you stand and worship God here with us this morning.
greater things There's no power like the power of Jesus Let faith arise, let all agree There's no power like the power of Jesus I will believe for greater things There's no power like the power of Jesus Let faith arise Good morning, everybody. Man, so good to be with you. Here we are, week three of our conversation that we've been having together over this little book called The Power to Change. Um, I've just enjoyed it, man. I, I, I found this book uh, about a year ago, and it's been uh, the kind of catalyst from, for some real change in my own life. If, if you would like to grab this book, uh, you are in luck today. If you head out to the lobby, there are no more physical copies here, but you can scan the little QR code, and Amazon will have it to your door by this afternoon, I think, probably, or something. That's what Amazon does. Uh, but man, I've just really enjoyed the conversation that we've been having together. I don't know about you, but I find myself often in life thinking, man, I wish this or that would change. Anybody else? And really finding out, like, how do I experience that change? Because I uh, always find myself in these ruts where, like, I, I get all gung-ho and I say, man, I want this to change or I'm going to do this or I'm going to figure out this or do these three steps to my, my beach body self or whatever. And then by Monday afternoon, I'm eating a bucket of ice cream again. <laughs> Anybody else there uh, have the same experience with change? Uh, and we've been journeying with, um, through the book. And one of the things I, I don't love is that oftentimes when I do series over books, I just don't have enough time to like unpack all of the great nuggets that are within a book. And today is actually our last conversation over this series. So there's some things that are, are not kind of making it into our conversations here in person on Sunday. But you're in luck. If you read the book, you can get all those little nuggets uh, for yourself. 
But we've been journeying really through the stuff that has impacted me the most in the book. And if, if you remember, or if maybe you're new with us here today, never fear. Go on to gotothepoint.com. You can watch them on Facebook or watch them on replay. But in the first week, we kind of talked about, man, uh, God wants to show us that our first step to change is to stop doing things all the time. I'm like a master when it comes to that. I figure I want to do. I want to figure out this change. I'm going to go do a bunch of stuff, right? I'm going to. I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that, and. The first week, God really captivated my heart with this first step of saying, John, before you do anything, you need to know who you are, and I get to determine that. And we started kind of unpacking this reality of, man, before we go and do anything in terms of change, we need to hear who does God say that we are, and, sh- and, and he gets to show us the life that he wants us to have or who he wants us to become. And then we, do- we dove in last week to this powerfully challenging sentiment of that we need to stop trying all the time to accomplish change. That once we, once we are awakened to the reality of who God says we are, he opens our eyes to this truth that he shows us who we are, but then down the road he says, this is actually the best version of yourself, and you got some work to do. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but I oftentimes come against the reality that I have not arrived. <laughs> And I need God to help me get from where I am to where he wants me to be. And last week we talked about the best way that that happens in our life is to stop trying and to start training. Uh, we, we call it a fancy word in the church called discipleship, that we want to put some discipline in our life so that we can become who God wants us to be. And we talked about how that is unpacked in the idea of that we need to start training rather than trying. And I love this last week because it, it kind of, for me, brings everything kind of full circle and with some real practical handles on, okay, I've learned who I am and I'm going to stop doing, and now I'm going to start l- learning what it means to train to become who God calls me to be. But really, what are the nuts and bolts of training? And, and when I, when I kind of asked myself that question this past week and navigated it again through God's word um, and also through this book, it started to bring to surface this this tension point that I experience often, and I wonder if you do too, where, where I have the, the places that I hope will change in my life, and then God kind of says, well, you need to quit hoping, and you need to start thinking more about habits. So we're going to talk about the collision between hope and habits this morning. Uh, 23 years ago, almost 24 years ago, uh, my wife, Heather, had a hope that she would meet the man of her dreams. And she did. (laughs) She hoped. And the one thing about her hope was that she couldn't accomplish that. Like it required something outside of her control, the power of God to make our paths cross. And sure enough, she met me. Her her hopes came true. Uh, And and we got married. I remember that day staring into her eyes and thinking, man, how great she must feel that she found me. Oh, no, I'm totally kidding. Uh, I was so grateful that I found her. I thought, man, how lucky am I? That I, And I had hopes too. And God brought us together. And I remember we went on our honeymoon, you know, and we came and did all, you know, came home and we, we were living together for the first time. And I thought, oh, this is like amazing. And I know Heather was just as excited as I was. And I remember waking up uh, one of the first few mornings and I just kind of started doing the things that I always did as a person, right? I got up and I, I took a shower. And when I got done with the shower, I reached out and I grabbed a towel, you know, and went off and did my, my thing that morning. And then I heard Heather get into the shower and she did the same thing she always does. And she reached over to get the towel and the towel was gone. <laughs> and we had this moment, this like this moment where we, I went, well, there's always a towel when I take a shower. I don't ever put it there, <laughs> but there's always a towel. And my wife said, I always put a towel there and it's not there now. And we had this this moment where Heather looked at me with with all the love, grace, and compassion of a newlywed and said, John, would you please uh, try to not use, there's that word, would you please try to not use my towel? And I went, oh, I didn't even think about that. Like, it's just always been there. It's a towel. And I get out of the shower and I I grab the towel. And she said, John, I hope that you won't do that again. Well, 23 years later, I take showers and her hopes have been dashed. (laughs) I still occasionally get out of the shower, don't think, and grab her towel, and to her dismay, and it it is an act of God that she still loves me the way that she does, even though I still 
uh, take her towel. And what is what kind of comes to the surface of something that I find interesting about my life, and I think this is probably true about your life, is that you have all kinds of habits. You have all kinds of things that you just do all the time. And I would, I would bet and, uh, that maybe probably 90% of those things are things you don't even think about. They're like when you get out of the shower and you grab a towel kind of things. You just, you just do them, whether you drive to work or you get up in the morning and you have your coffee or you sit down after work and you're so tired that you binge 40 episodes of your favorite show on Netflix. I don't know what it is for you, but I can guess that there are habits that happen all the time in your life because that's really what life is all about. There's a wise old guy, he's long dead now, named Aristotle, and he said it like this, we are what we repeatedly do. It's, it's kind of true, right? Like, who, you are all the collection of things that you repeatedly do over and over and over again. The problem is when you repeatedly do something that's not too good for your life, or in my case, for my marriage. <laughs> when I repeatedly use my wife's towel, it creates tension points. And I think, well, I want to change that. I hope one day that I will take showers and not use my wife's towel. And I think to myself, and I wonder if this is true, if you ever had this experience, that you do a lot of hoping and nothing changes. I, I hope, blank, I hope that I can lose 20 pounds. You know, or I hope that I won't spend all my money before my bills are due, you know? Or I hope that I could have a closer relationship with God. Or I hope that I could read the Bible more. You know, the thing about hope is that hope is dependent upon an outside influence, if you really think about it. Right? It's, it's not, it's, when I hope for something, what I'm, what I'm saying is there's something out there that needs to happen that is beyond my control, so I'm going to trust that it will happen without any like, action required on my part. And the good thing about hope is that there are certain situations where we need to hope. I hope someday that when I die, that won't be the end. <laughs> it's kind of why we're here today, right? And, and the, my hope for be, what's beyond my death is not dependent upon anything that I can accomplish on my own, thank God, right? And it lives in this territory of faith. But the problem is, if we let hope live in places where it requires our influence, hope becomes a cop-out, right? We say, oh, I, like I, for my own life, I hope that I could exercise more. <laughs> well, as I'm eating, you know, as I, that's my exercise, right? Anybody exercise like this? I have giant forearms. <laughs> from my exercise. But we need to find a different way because here's the truth of it that I've discovered in my own life, and I think this is probably true for you, is that hope is not a strategy for change. You will never accomplish any real change in your life by just merely hoping that something would happen or could happen in your life. I'm not going to figure out the towel situation by hoping that tomorrow morning I won't use my wife's towel. Because the truth of it is, this habit in my life is when I get out of the shower, I'm going to reach for a towel. And if I didn't put one there and my wife's is the only one there, I'm going to use her towel, you know? And, and hoping doesn't change any of that. What I need is for a new habit to form. I need to lose an old habit and I need to get a new one. And I think in the midst of that kind of idea lives what we're going to talk about today. Because last week we talked about how we need to train instead of try. And I think habits kind of plug in play here in this idea of what does training really mean? What does it look like to train, to become who God wants you to be? And what does it mean to truly train? And I believe habits are the nuts and bolts. They're, they're like the regimen that live in training. The habits are this regimen, the things that we do in order to train. So we're going to talk about how do we find our way to being people who can stop doing certain habits and start doing other habits in order to find our way to living our best life, the life that God wants for us. We're going to, we're going to find our way through a story um, that happened in 600 BC. It was a long, long time ago. A guy named Daniel. And I'm going to give you kind of just a survey of Daniel's life. You can find this in the scriptures. I believe it's around page 999 in your Bible. That's, that was what it was in mine. Uh, but Daniel, uh, through Daniel like 1 through chapter 7, kind of giving a survey of what was going on in his life. So Daniel was a, a guy who was an Israelite. He lived in ancient Israel. and Obviously, 600 BC was a long time ago. And he was living during a, a very chaotic time with his people. Uh, some bad things had gone on. They had wandered away from God. And the consequences of that, uh, dis those decisions for the people of Israel is that they went into exile. And what exile meant was that a foreign king said, I want your country and you're no longer 
who you were. You're going to come live with me. And so Daniel, it says in chapter 1, that Nebuchadnezzar came and took over the people of Israel and took them away uh, to his, his town and his, or his cities and cultures. And so Daniel finds himself in this situation where life is just full of chaos. And what we're going to see here through Daniel's story is moment after moment where he's, he, he's experiencing hard things in his own life, hard things in the life of his people, but something is, is giving stability to Daniel's life. Something is not only holding him together, but something is allowing him to kind of rise to the surface in the situations that he's facing. It's allowing him, you'll, we'll see, it's allowing him to be successful and to overcome and, and to find his way in, in his hope for God and what God is doing in his life. But something lives in Daniel's life that I think can teach us a powerful lesson today to lead us towards true and lasting change. See, Daniel found himself in exile under the rule of King Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar was a, a mystic. He was a guy who had dreams all the time and had questions. And, and so he had lots of these things happening to him. And he would always go to his astrologists and his, his wise people and say, hey, figure out these things that are happening to me. Tell me what my dreams mean. And nobody here with Nebuchadnezzar could help Nebuchadnezzar know what the dreams meant. And all of a sudden, there was a, a group of about 100 leaders within the people of Israel that were kind of in the system of Nebuchadnezzar's training. That's what he did with, with like people from other cultures. And Daniel kind of rose to the surface. And some of the high officials told the king, hey, you should go talk to this dude because he's kind of got his life together and he's really wise. And so Daniel finds his way before King Nebuchadnezzar and he, he tells the king what his dreams were all about. And and it was such a profound encounter that Nebuchadnezzar had with Daniel that he noticed that something was different about Daniel's life. Imagine that, D Daniel living in exile under a foreign king, and all of a sudden this king says, man, of all these wise people, no one is as wise as this guy. Something's going on that's right about his life. And so much so that the king eventually worshipped and honored Yahweh because of the influence of Daniel's life. Fast forward to Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, who had the same kind of experience. He had some mysteries going on in his life, some dreams he couldn't explain, and years had passed, and here comes Daniel again, rising to the surface. And then a, a third son of, of Belshazzar, the, the son of Belshazzar, Darius, has the same issue. And over and over and over again, Daniel bubbles to the surface as someone who is who's a leader, someone who knows how to live life right. And in the midst of all of the chaos, something is holding Daniel's life together. And it comes all the way to the end of the story with, with Darius. And eventually, if you're successful enough, there's going to be certain people that don't like it. And that's what happened in this moment of the story of Daniel. There were some other leaders around the King Darius and said, we don't like Daniel. And we don't like that he's always getting the attention. Daniel had risen to where he had been given leadership and rulership over the country. And that's how much God had blessed Daniel and all that he was doing. And people wanted to take him down. And they knew that the only way they could get at Daniel, the only way that they could cut him down was if they cut down his faith. So they went before King Darius and they tricked the king to, to set into law a decree that everyone in the kingdom could only pray to the king. And all of a sudden, there was a moment where Daniel's life, again, hit some tension. And something held Daniel fast. We're going to read in Daniel chapter 6 that what comes to the surface that was really the, the foundation for Daniel becoming who God longed for him to be. It says this, then, oh, actually, this is not the one. Keep going. It's all the way, keep going, keep going. It's the last scripture. Keep going, keep going. I think we have some craziness with our slides. Keep going. No, go forward. Anyway, okay, so Daniel, here's what it says. Daniel heard about this decree, and the decree said, Daniel, you can only pray to the king. But Daniel, in response to this decree, it says in the scriptures in Daniel chapter 6 that Daniel went to his rooms, and he knelt facing the city of Jerusalem. He knelt and he prayed three times a day as he always did before. And this 
What we see coming to the surface of Daniel's life is something so very simple, but I believe, I believe holds so much power for us to experience the change that we long for in life. Because Daniel's life was filled with chaos all around him. And eventually, if you, if you don't know the story, go and read it. Eventually, that choice to do the same habit that formed him as a person led him into a pit full of hungry lions. It was, he was sentenced to death. And yet, even still... I believe the thing that kept Daniel connected to the power of God in his life, connected to the vision of who God said he was and who God was creating him to be, was this habit that, that simply lived in the foundation of Daniel's life. There it is, three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to God. And oftentimes I read the story and I, I, get to my, I get like to the pit of the lion's den and all this craziness happening around Daniel's life and I miss this. And I don't want us to miss this today because friends, if, if you're longing for change in your life and God has began to open your eyes to who you are and that you have this deep desire to not want to try anymore, but th that you want to train, you want to become who God longed for you to become. Today, we, we discovered that the, the nuts and bolts of that training regimen is learning how to form habits that mold us into who God has called us to be. And those habits move us and direct us towards a vision of who God has created us to be. They did this in Daniel's life. A habit, Craig Rochelle says this in his book, and he says it better than I can, so I'm just going to quote him. He says, a habit shaped Daniel's identity, giving him the confidence, check it out, giving Daniel the confidence to be who God created him to be and do what God called him to do. Yep. Like, don't miss it. The, Daniel's life his success, his perseverance through chaotic and hard situations, his faith in God, his vision of who God has called him to be was, was not fueled by some great talent. It wasn't even fueled by, by Daniel crying out and saying, God, change this, do this in your power. No, it was formed and shaped by Daniel's repeatable small habit of every day and morning, afternoon and night, he would kneel in his room and he would pray. He would connect with God. And every day, every morning, every afternoon and every night, every day, every day, every day, this habit shaped who Daniel was and who Daniel would become. And I want you to hear me, church, today. Never, ever underestimate how God can start something big in your life through something small. And too often we jump to the big, we jump to the glorious. Like we, we got this thing and God sh come down and rain lightning and show up and heal and restore and say, like we all love the encounter. But I think oftentimes God says, don't miss the encounter in these small repeatable moments that have the power to change everything in your life. And too often we live in the land of hope and we say, God, we hope someday this will be better. And we hope someday for this. And we hope someday for that. And God says, man, hope is such a powerful emotion. But habits are, is what leads you to the change that you so desire and hope for. And God wants, I believe, for us to get down to the details today, to get down to the basics in our life. So how... And that kind of surface, like comes to the surface in my life. God, I want more of you. I want to become who you've called me to be. So help me. How do I train? And how do I form habits in my life? Right? I think that's the real question. And I want to get like super practical today. Would that be okay? So like I need some strategies. I don't know about you, but I need some strategies because I'm all about this habit thing. But again, Monday comes around and I'm eating my bucket of ice cream and I get out of the shower and take Heather's towel again, right? Like I need some practical handles. How do I, like take the problem of the towel situation, the towel crisis of the Gibson family. How could I find my way to creating a habit that might, might bring change to that small problem in my marriage? Well, I, I found some really helpful tools, I believe, uh, called the art of the start. And Pastor Groeschel says this. He says, Here, here's one way to set a habit in motion in your life, to start your pathway to change. It's, he says, to decide when and where something will happen. So for example, after I shower, I will take the towel that I put there before I shower. Okay, well, there's a problem with that, right? I gotta do something before that. So then after I have my coffee, I'm gonna go take a towel 
and put it on the hanger. So that way, after I shower, I take my towel, not Heather's. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. You all can praise the Lord that he's changing Pastor John. Right? My wife is celebrating at home today. So how can you start a habit? Maybe for you, your habit is, I want a deeper relationship with God. And maybe you need to stop hoping for that. Right? And, and create some habits that lead you to the thing that you hope for. So what would it look like to grow deeper with God? We could follow Daniel's example. And we could kind of use this tool in your own life. That Maybe for you, it's after I have my coffee in the morning, I will sit down in this chair and pray. Thank you, Pastor Joel, for that vision in your life. After I have my coffee, I will pray. Or after I take my shower, I will, I will read the Bible. When and where? When and where? When and where? I believe God's challenge for us today and for you today is to get practical and to decide. And may, here's my hope and my prayer for, for you has been this week is that you will decide one habit that you want to stop this week and one habit that you want to start. And that maybe you would start using a strategy like this to say, okay, God, here's the habit I want to start this week. Help me to determine when and where so that it can become a repeatable moment that will shape me into who you've called me to be as a person. Because friends, that's what God desires for you most, is to not stay where you are, but to become who God has called you to be, to change and be transformed into who God has created you to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, I'm grateful for practical days like today. And Lord, I confess in my own heart that I, I long for encounter. I long for big change and transformative moments. And, but God, I'm so grateful to feel the challenge of your spirit in my own life this week. It says, John, those are good. Those are transformational moments. But you also, John, need to focus on the small, repeatable habits of your life. Because so many of them are leading you away from me. And you need to start some new ones that will lead you towards me. God, thank you for that challenge. And I pray that for my friends, that they would hear your voice in the same way today. To speak into their hearts and say, hey, these habits are going on that are leading you away from my best for you. And maybe here's one habit that you need to start to become who I've created you to become. God, I pray that you would do your work now. And, and I'm grateful for the reminder, God, that we do have the hope that you are the same God who was in Daniel's life. The same God who spoke into Daniel's life, showed him the way to repeatable habits that gave him what he needed to go through everything that he went through. Through upheaval and chaos and crisis and pain and danger. And yet, at the, in the foundation of his life, didn't live these big miraculous things, but instead lived this habit where he went and talked to you three times a day, each and every day. God, there's such profound truth that lives there. Help us to see it. Do the same work that you did then in us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
children then you hear my children now you are the same god you are the same god you answers prayers back then and you will answer now you are the same god you are the same god you were providing then you are providing now you are what we need church amen the infilling of the holy spirit in our lives i want to i tell you a quick story about my my day yesterday my wife becky and i have two teenage kids and we're in that stage of life uh, that's busy many of you have been there or you're getting ready to be there and a lot going on and both of our kids are in in what they call show choir and those show choirs compete in competition and it's amazing to me the amount of training that goes in for them to, to, to tighten up their harmonies and to all together be in the same movement as they're doing that to music. And it's just amazing to me the amount of training these kids put in to do what they do. And so my kids were part of that yesterday. They began their morning super early on a Saturday. I'm talking like two in the morning, right? Early. They get to the school at four and they make their way up north and they come from all over the state and they're going to compete. And so they were there literally from two o'clock in the morning to we got home at one o'clock this morning. Incredible training that happens for this. In the middle of the, the, the day, my, uh, there's kind of a break and they're getting ready to go to finals, which both of my kids made it to finals. Yeah, good. But my daughter pulls out her phone and she shows me this picture. And gathered in the cafeteria there at that high school up in Anderson. 
There was a group of, I don't know how many kids gathered around a table. She said, Dad, this is our show choir Bible study. I'm like, what? She said, this is our show choir Bible study. She said, one of our peers, all of man who's had a passion that we would gather together and in times like these and we're just gonna be in the word. And so we've developed a show choir Bible study. And she said, there's even kids there that are gathered around that table. They don't know Jesus. We just are in the word. And man, I say, uh, kudos to all of man too. That's all I got to say, right? Because there's a habit in her life for, for a hunger and thirst for the things of God. And they've got downtime and idle time in, in, in something like this. And, and so I think a group of kids realizes the most important thing of our lives is not show choir. It's not getting up on a stage and, and moving and that's fun and that's good and it, it creates some great things in their life and some great experiences. But it's like, you know what? We're, we're disciples of Jesus, number one. That's what it's about, y'all. That's what D Daniel had determined in his life, folks, is I'm a disciple of the Most High God above anything else in my life. And that's what Pastor John has challenged us to. That what are the habits in our lives that are, that are setting us apart as disciples of Jesus Christ? What are we doing? Are we, are we hungering and are we thirsting for the things of God like that in our lives? I've been challenged. I've been challenged by this series and in my own life. And you have today to, to really put handles to this. What is one habit that will draw you closer to Jesus that you need to begin in your life? That's called training, folks. It is called training so that you can be who he's called you to be and you can go out and you can affect people. You can be the olive man tooths of the world, right? We can gather a group of high school kids on a, on a secular high school campus in the midst of a show choir competition and fill several tables lined up and just be in the Word of God. Come on. That's good. Good. Good stuff. So that's our challenge this week. Habit, one thing we're going to stop. And another one that we're going to start that's going to draw us closer to Jesus. Would you stand with me in this place? A couple things that I want to make you aware of before you leave. Starting points happening today. Perhaps you're, you're new with us or you're a guest. You've been attending a while and you're like, I want to know more about this place. Starting Point is a great place to do that. You go out of the worship center, turn to your right. There's a banner right there to the right of the lobby that says Starting Point. There's an amazing couple in there, Dave and Anita Reeser, and they would love to connect with you in Starting Point. About 20 minutes, you may say, I got kids upstairs. It's good. Miss Kelly knows all about it. They're going to take care of them during that time. So we would love to connect with you in Starting Point is your next step. And then Baby Bottles. Uh, Clarity is a partner ministry with The Point here locally. They make a difference in the lives of people. And so we want to be able to partner with Clarity. And our reach team here at The Point has challenged us. Could we raise $2,500 through the Baby Bottle campaign to give to Clarity? And so on your way out on both ends of the lobby, you'll see some pink and blue balloons and some baby bottles. You're like, what do we do with that? Take that baby bottle. You can fill it with change. You can put a check in it. You can put cash in it, however you want to do that. Or there's a QR code there as well on the table, on the wall that you can scan and you can give directly through that QR code. It goes directly through the point into Clarity. And so we wanna make sure you, you have that opportunity. Take those baby bottles. In the next two weeks, we're gonna be collecting them here in the same places. All right, so let's partner together. Starting point, baby bottles. One habit you're gonna stop, one habit you're gonna start. Amen. God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you. The same God the very same God of, of Daniel, the very same God of Mary and Moses and Jacob and David. And we worship you today, King Jesus. And we love you and we praise you and we thank you. Stir in us, God, stir in us just a passion for the things of you. And it's in Christ's name we pray and all of God's people said, amen. Go in his grace and in his peace. Thanks for worshiping with us today, church.